Prime Minister Justin Trudeau gets what's coming to him in Europe, and more of the legacy media's fake news narrative about the trucker convoy comes crumbling apart. It's Fake News Friday. I'm Kenneth Malcolm, and this is The Kenneth Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. So we're going to start off with some news, not necessarily fake news per se, uh, but just Justin Trudeau embarrassing himself, embarrassing Canada on the world stage. It's sort of like a weekly occurrence here uh, with with our prime minister every time he goes abroad. And for some reason, he keeps going back to Europe. Uh, every time he does, he embarrasses us. So joining me for Fake News Friday is True North producer and journalist Harrison Faulkner. Harrison, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Candice. I've been looking forward to this all week. And so I know this is going to be a good episode. It's like, I, I don't really understand why Justin Trudeau keeps going back to Europe. But alas, he, he is back this time. He is talking to the European Parliament, basically lecturing Europeans, telling them what they already know, pretending that he is this great statesman uh, there to tell everybody, bestow his wisdom on democracy and democratic ethics or something like that. Uh, the reality is that Justin Trudeau doesn't know what he's talking about, and more and more people are seeing through this. So Trudeau's office put out a release saying that on March 23rd, the Prime Minister will address the European Parliament, where he will speak on peace and security, defending democracy, and transatlantic cooperation for the people of Canada and the European Union. Trudeau calls on the European leaders to unite, to aid Ukraine, and to further sanction Russia. I, again, it, it's just it's just so irritating to see our Prime Minister go out there and, and lecture people, put on his sort of grown-up voice, and, 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 and just you know, tell us again what we already know. Uh, interesting that, uh, I, I, I won't put you through uh, Justin Trudeau's whole speech because it is pretty uh, cringeworthy. However, there is one part that really, really stood out. And again, I, I apologize um, in advance because watching this clip just makes you, it's, it's, just, so, it's just so awful. He, he's so terrible, the way he speaks, uh, the way that he talks, the things that he talks about. So here he is demonizing the truckers. He goes all the way to Europe to lecture them about democracy and he can't help himself but providing his own own revisionist idea of what happened during the trucker convoy. So here he is uh, reliving the trucker convoy, uh, completely making things up about the truckers and, and, and talking about how he sees the situation. Here's that clip. Even in Canada, where 90% of people are vaccinated and our motto as a country is peace, order and good government, we saw anti-vaccine and anti-government protests devolve into illegal occupations of our communities and blockades of our borders. The leaders of those convoys were effective in turning citizens with real anxieties against the system best suited to allay those concerns. So blaming everybody but himself and, again, making it seem like he's the good guy. He, his systems are, are there to allay our concerns, and, and anyone fighting against him is just uh, exploiting anxieties and turning people against each other. Well, uh, the, the the legacy media, Trudeau's uh, press gallery, his, his, his approved journalists, they, their job is to make Prime Minister Trudeau look good. Um, and it's a, it's a tough job because Prime Minister is just so bad at what he does. Regardless, here is David Aiken being a good journalist and uh, you try, trying to make it seem like Trudeau's speech was more broadly attended than it actually was. The reality is, you look at this uh, clip here, you can see that the, the seats are mostly empty. The chamber is mostly empty. There are 705 members of the European Parliament. Most of those seats are empty. Uh, here is David Aiken saying that he counts about 200 out of the 705. No. I look at that clip and I see maybe 40, 50 people. Uh, but Aiken notes, the gallery however, is packed. So we're supposed to believe that there's all these adoring fans up top watching Trudeau. Uh, the reality is that most of these European politicians and officials, they don't want to hear what Justin Trudeau has to say. They, they, they know that he is full of nonsense, that he's not going to say anything when he speaks. So they don't even bother to show up. The few people who did show up didn't take it very well, Harrison. They didn't really like what they saw. And we, we saw people give Trudeau a piece of their mind. So so here here we see Members of the European Parliament, you know, oftentimes in Canada, we don't think that uh, people are really paying attention to us, especially over in Europe. They have real issues uh, to concern themselves with. Here is a German member of the European Parliament, member of the ADF party, which is the right wing populist party in Germany, giving Justin Trudeau a piece of her mind. And you can see that she really carefully follows this up. She, she, she knows Trudeau. She follows him quite closely. And she gives a pretty scathing 
uh, criticism of Trudeau. And, and amusingly, you can see Justin Trudeau is seated right behind her. So you can see uh, he's not very happy, not very pleased uh, with this criticism. But here is that clip. Thank you. Based on Article 195, out that it would have been more appropriate for Mr. Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, to address this House according to Article 144, an article which was specifically designed to debate violations of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, which is clearly the case with Mr. Trudeau. Then again, a Prime Minister who openly admires the Chinese basic dictatorship who tramples on fundamental rights by persecuting and criminalizing his own citizens as terrorists just because they dared to stand up to his perverted concept of democracy should not be allowed to speak in this house at all. Mr. Trudeau, you are a disgrace for any democracy. Please spare us your presence. Thank you. Again, pretty devastating. And uh, Christine Anderson is not the only one. So this was a theme. The reactions to Justin Trudeau were not rosy. They were not positive. They were not good. Here is another member of the European Parliament. This one from Croatia. Apologies if I get this name incorrect, but his name is Mislav Klakusi. And he is a former judge and an independent member. He also had a very scathing criticism of the Canadian Prime Minister. Here is what that sounded like. Canada. Nekada simbol modernog svijeta je pod va- vodstvom vaše kvazi liberalne čizme proteklih mjeseci postala simbol kršenja temeljnih ljudskih prava i građanskih sloboda. Gledali smo kako konjima gaze žene, kako samohranim roditeljima blokirate bankovne račune da ne mogu platiti djeci školovanje da ne mogu platiti lijekove, da ne mogu platiti račune za struju i vodu, da ne mogu platiti rate kredita za svoje domove. Za vas su to možda liberalne metode. Međutim, za mnoge građane svijeta to je diktatura najgore vrste. Budite uvjereni da građani svijeta, udruženi, mogu zaustaviti svaki režim koji želi uništiti slobodu građana bilo bombama, bilo štetnim farmaceutskim proizvodima. Hvala. Uh, so for people who were just listening and didn't see the subtitles there, he's, he says, Prime Minister Trudeau, in recent months, under a quasi-liberal boot, Canada has become a symbol of civil rights violations. The methods we have witnessed may be liberal to you, but to many citizens around the world, it seemed like a dictatorship of the worst kind. Again, Truly devastating stuff. And Prime Minister Justin Trudeau goes abroad. He is used to being treated as some kind of a uh, liberal golden boy. He likes to be seen as a sort of last best hope for progressive liberalism on the world stage. The reality is that the rest of the world doesn't see it that way. They see him for the fool that he is, someone who goes out there, talks a lot of nonsense about liberalism and then governs in the complete opposite way, not giving people uh, the, the, their basic rights, not listening to people, not there uh, in, in the way that you would expect the prime minister. So interesting to see the prime minister being called out this way. Uh, final criticism came from an individual in the a Romanian member of the European Parliament named uh, Christian Teres. He released a statement. He said that he didn't bother to go to the uh, speech because he didn't want to listen to Trudeau, but he put out a statement. So uh, our own Cosmin Jurja, who is Romanian, or he speaks Romanian, he translated the statement, and he said that Teres blasted Trudeau for having horses trampling protesters during the Freedom Convoy. He writes this, I refuse to validate by my presence the facade of the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who gave a speech before the plenary of the European Parliament on March 23rd. It was the reason for which I was not in the room when he spoke. You can't come and teach democracy less lessons to Putin from the European Parliament when you trample with horse hooves on your own citizens who are demanding that their fundamental rights be respected. Pretty devastating stuff. There is an old clip from this same member of the European Parliament back in February 22 reacting to the trucker convoy. He criticized Trudeau for invoking the Emergencies Act used to quash protests in Ottawa. So here is what that clip looked like from February 2022. And what the Prime Minister of Canada, the way he's behaving right now, He's exactly like a tyrant, like a dictator. He's like Ceausescu in Romania. If even you doubt, if you raise doubts about the vaccines, you're outcasted. What's the difference between what he does and what happened under the Inquisition? 
See, on one side they say, well, we should not believe in God. But on the other side they say, believe in science. We don't have to. Science is not about belief. Science, science is about measurements, conclusions, hypotheses, and arguments. We got to a point right now where even if you say something, if you raise any doubts, you're already considered, you know, as whatever, you know. They label you in very different ways. This is not okay. And I should just note that this individual, Therese from Romania, as well as the first woman that we showed, uh, Christian Anderson from Germany, uh, they both are described as far right in much of the mainstream media. So not necessarily endorsing them uh, in their individual politics or home country, uh, but just sharing them to show the kind of criticism that Trudeau is receiving on the world stage. <laughs> kind of funny enough, the left wing uh, woke blog site Vice lists Terez as one of the most dangerous new MEPs in the European Parliament. I don't know if that's a badge of honor or what. But Harrison, what did you make of this whole situation of uh, Justin Trudeau on the world stage? Well, I mean, he knew what he was going to get with the European Parliament because obviously the Christian Terez speech went viral back during the convoy protest, calling him, uh, comparing him to Ceausescu and saying that he's a tyrant. So he knew what he was going to get. He must be some sort of glutton for punishment because it was clear that he was going to get roasted uh, at this address, especially when he's going there to lecture these European politicians on democracy. But I made this point yesterday on Twitter, and it's just that I would love to see this kind of energy from the opposition benches in Canada, uh, because these European politicians must have been waiting for their chance for quite a while. They knew that he was going to come to uh, come to their own backyard, and so they came up with some. They had some really, really devastating things to say, and I think this all just points up to a much larger problem that Canada has, which is which is the degradation of our image on the world stage. Canada is not what it used to be. It's not viewed as the country it used to be. And that is largely because, as these European politicians point out, because of the way that our prime minister has behaved. And I think that whoever takes, the, whoever takes on the role of being prime minister after Justin Trudeau has, has a lot of work to do. Um, they, they really do have to take into account the damage to the image and the credibility of our country. Um, when when trying to repair, you know, the damage that Trudeau has done. But, you know, as, as you said, the German MEP, uh, Anderson, she's, she watches Trudeau quite closely. She pulls up the basic dictatorship line, the, the admiration Trudeau has for China's basic, basic dictatorship, and, and she says that, she, that, that he trampled on the, on the basic rights of Canadians and that he's a disgrace to any democracy. That is, uh, that, that, that's some serious language that cannot just be swept aside. I mean, the country, the prime minister, and the government has to address the fact that uh, the European Parliament does not respect our prime minister. They didn't even they didn't even show up to his speech. It's I don't even know, Candace, if the if the country has ever been viewed this bad on the world stage. It's so interesting because after the uh, use of the Emergencies Act, I had um, uh, Cave Chirouz from the McDonald Laurier Institute come on. And we talked about how uh, world dictators and sort of human rights abusers are going to use this as an opportunity to dismiss Trudeau, saying you can't come lecture us about human rights because look at the way you treat them in your own country. Uh, we didn't even cover the fact that other Western liberal democracies um, might be viewing this in the same way and they just wouldn't take Canada seriously. I think that, you know, it's one thing to have uh, Xi Jinping or Ahmadinejad or one of these crazy uh, dictators or former dictators mocking Canada. Uh, but then on the other hand, having our, our fellow kind of Western liberal democracy uh, leaders come out and say this kind of stuff against Trudeau is equally as devastating. And I think you're right that, that Canada's image in the world stage is just simply not what it has been in the past. And the only one to blame for that uh, is Justin Trudeau. Hopefully he'll have a little bit of a realization about that over there. Uh, Harris, I want to move on and talk about this story that got thoroughly debunked this week. This was sort of one of the major talking points on the political left during the Freedom Convoy, this idea that there was an arson attack that was part of the convoy. So go going back to February of this year, right in the middle of the Freedom Convoy, the story kind of emerged on Twitter of this apparent arson that was taking place. If you recall, there was a long Twitter thread by an individual who claimed to live in the building, and he, he was sort of 
putting all the pieces together. The story didn't add up. Uh, I recall Jonathan Kay, the uh, journalist over at Quillette, he, uh, he was thoroughly debunking it on social media, how absurd on the face it was. Uh, however, so many in the media and especially so many politicians picked up on this idea that the Freedom Convoy was unsafe. And here's a prime example. There was this attempted arson of a building. It went so far and so absurd as to say that some eyewitness uh, claimed that the guy that was trying to burn down the building yelled out, I'm part of the Freedom Convoy or something like that. Like it, it just, it made no sense. Okay. So anyway, so we now have officially cleared um, the Freedom Convoy of any involvement. The Ottawa Police Services announced that they had the individual, they arrested him, they knew who he was, and he had nothing to do with the Freedom Convoy uh, whatsoever. So so on Monday of this week, the Ottawa Police Services released uh, the statement saying that the man was charged in the February Lisgar Street arson investigation. The man has been charged in relation to deliberately set fire in an apartment building on Lisgar on February 6, 2022. A second man is still wanted by the police. Ottawa Police arson investigators charged Connor Russell McDonald, 21 years old of Ottawa, with one count of the following, and then it's just a bunch of different uh, charges related to arson and uh, disregard for human life, and it makes a note right here, there is no information indicating McDonald was involved in any way with the convoy protest which was going on when this arson took place. I, I could have told you that, Harrison. I mean, even as soon as the story came up, it was so patently clear. Like, like I can't say that every single person at the Freedom Convoy was a good law-abiding person. I'm sure that there were some bad people mixed in there. But by and large, the Freedom Convoy was characterized um, by a bunch of people who were hardworking uh, truckers, people who play by the rules, follow the rules, even just the way that they kept the street clean, they sort of self-policed, they were making sure uh, that to, to do everything they could you know, to, to, to be respectful of the community that they were in. It didn't make any sense that these guys would be out there trying to burn down buildings randomly in the middle of their freedom convoy. They were there to make a political point at the home of our democracy. That's what they were doing. And this story never really made sense in the first place. Well, now it's completely cleared. Uh, Justin Ling, who was one of the journalists who was really pushing this idea that this was somehow connected to the freedom convoy in the first place, he even wrote that, that he had information saying this guy was part of the homeless shelter system, um, that he may have been mentally unwell or or, or you know, perhaps on some kind of a, a drug-fueled uh, mentally mental instability. So, so here you have a local person in Ottawa, uh, you know, creating mischief, and it was conflated and blamed on the truckers. Uh, to, to me, this, this just shows the desire by the left and the media. They just so badly wanted the truckers to be breaking law and, and you know, disregarding human life and threatening people um, that even a story that didn't really seem to add up at all, uh, they jumped on it and pretended that it was a, a huge central part of the trucker convoy. What did you think of this one? I mean, it's, it, you're, you're exactly right that there was, a, there was a, an attempt from the very beginning to use this as a way to promote a, uh, a a narrative about the trucker convoy protest, and it was used as a way to you know promote the violent crackdown that we saw, um, you know, which I believe to be one of the one of the more shameful moments in our recent history. Uh, this idea that these were violent extremists, they were looking that the media, these politicians were looking for any excuse they could to try and complete that narrative about these people. But as you said, Candice, you you could have you could have pointed this out from the very beginning when this story was released, so could I. Because that's not the that's not the typical behavior of one of these trucker convoy protesters. Actually, that's kind of the typical behavior of maybe a far radical left wing activist trying to push for violence. This is more of an Antifa type of act. And the person it was all on video, the person didn't even look like he was part of the trucker convoy protest. So well, yeah, he was a 21-year-old guy with purple hair, right? It's like Yeah, yeah. So clearly from the start, those that were actually paying attention knew that this was bogus to begin with. Um, but it didn't matter. It didn't stop um, politicians, obviously, from the left from going out and putting on the public record that this was part of the convoy protest. And True North's Cosme and Georgia put together a montage of these politicians saying just that, and this is what that looked like. Violence is commonplace. We saw an example of this violence, an attempted arson downtown of an apartment building where people started a fire. When they exited, they taped the door. And an attempted arson, all of which, Madam Speaker, was caught on video. It has been an illegal occupation that has uh, been harassing people in residential areas of Ottawa. People don't feel safe in their own homes. There have been reports of attempted arson. Canadians 
are also concerned hearing reports of an attempted arson in the lobby of a residential apartment building. Because we see um, hate speech, we see uh, illegal acts such as arson. The incessant honking, the arson attempts. The incessant honking, the arson attempts. An attempted arson of a residential building in the occupation area. We've seen the active sabotage of 911 emergency call lines and even an attempted arson. Other alleged crimes have even been more egregious. Ottawa police are investigating the attempted arson of a downtown apartment building. The situation persists, fueled in part by foreign funding. We saw reports of attempted arson in some of the buildings. And it certainly does not include arson or pushing into a residential apartment building and barricading the exits with handcuffs. The arrests for conspiracy to murder, attempted arson of a residential building. Over the past three weeks, we have watched assaults, attempted arson. They have been living in fear, fear that their apartment buildings may be torched by arson. Seen assaults, attempted arson, widespread harassment. There's been attempted arson with the attempt of handcuffing doors shut so that if a fire started, people would be burned alive. And Death threats, an attempted arson. A building had an attempted arson where the doors were taped shut. Another building had occupiers attempting to handcuff the doors. There are reports of attempted arson, bomb threats. Hate crimes, misogyny, arson. Horns honked all night long. We saw thefts and attempted arson. So no, none of those politicians knew what they were talking about. None of them bothered to verify or look into the story. It was just too convenient uh, of a storyline. So they just went with it without doing any kind of due diligence. Harrison, what a disgrace, all of those politicians. They all owe an apology to the Freedom Convoy. We're not going to get one. Uh, but but if, if the media actually cared about holding people to account, they would be calling up all of those MPs, uh, asking them whether they wished to retract their comments. I, I wanted to note one other thing, that the main accuser, the individual who put out the first Twitter thread, he jumped on Twitter to try to sort of circle the whole square of uh, you know his false accusation in the first place. He wrote this. I said it once and I'll say it again. The convoy created a lawless scenario in Ottawa's core that acted as a catalyst for the arson attempt to occur. We who lived through this and almost had our building burnt down know this. Okay, so 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 just imagine this this logic, uh, Harrison, that, that somehow, even though the truckers had nothing to do with this, even though the guy was a local guy who was part of the part of the shelter system. Uh, somehow the truckers are still to blame, even though the guy had nothing to do with the trucker company. The truckers are still to blame because they created chaos in the in the nation's capital. Uh, what, what, what kind of logic? This is this is just so absurd. Well, I, of course, and like you said, don't expect any don't expect any retractions or apologies from any of these politicians. I mean, the mayor of Ottawa, who uh, had his fifteen minutes in the spotlight during this entire time, he thoroughly made took advantage of that. He said uh, in regards to the arson attempt that it, it was a horrific story that clearly demonstrates the malicious intent of the protesters occupying our city. So again, don't expect anything, um, don't expect any apologies from these guys. Uh, they accomplished their goal, which was to demonize the convoy protesters enough to justify a brutal crackdown um, on that on that Saturday. And also, I want to point out this global news story because one thing that really bugs me uh, about the way that the legacy media report on stories is they may indicate something in the headline, but they'll bury all the actual important details so deep into the story, uh, knowing that no one's going to get there. This global news story, although they point out in the headline that police dismissed the convoy connection, they don't actually put that in the story until the 10th paragraph after the fact, they've already, in the article about the arson, uh, the, the person involved in the arson getting arrested, they, they, they still go after the incessant honking and the harassment from the protesters. So again, it's, 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 it was a concerted effort by legacy media and these politicians to paint the protest as something that it wasn't and to justify uh, a horrendous crackdown. So it's really, it's really shameful all around. Yeah, it's a huge vindication for the truckers and for people who were defending them because obviously they weren't violent in nature and this is just another evidence, uh, a point of evidence. And and it's just so devastating for the legacy media. This is this is like the epitome of a fake news story in Canada. They just completely make up a storyline without validating it. Even when the story gets dismissed, 
and discredited Harrison, they still run with the same storyline. They say, okay, well, well, that part wasn't true, but all this other stuff is still true. It's like, no one trusts you. No one trusts you to the legacy media. And this story is exactly a case in point why. One f- final story I wanted to cover here today on Fake News Friday, Harrison, is this, this hilarious story. This is just so good. So the CBC reported on a woman who applied for a bank and the woman is First Nations and she is outraged because during the interview process or during the uh, job application process, she was asked some questions about her indigenous identity and that is very offensive to her. So the headline reads, a woman outraged CIBC job application suggests traditional regalia for video cover letter. And so we learn about the story of a 21-year-old Obijwe and Métis woman who was looking for a job at a bank. She was a part-time receptionist at a hair salon. She was looking for another job. She speaks French and she thought that she would be a good candidate. But then when she went to apply, basically they asked her a bunch of questions about her heritage that were really trivial and kind of like diminishing or offensive to her. And so the whole story, like CBC reports this deadpan, like it's this outrageous thing that this First Nations woman was asked these kind of questions. It's like, this this is a scenario that the CBC has created. It pushes this like woke idea that we have to have affirmative action hiring, that we have to hi- uh, have special treatment for certain people, and that we need to be more inclusive of people in a certain community. Then when the banks go along with that and say, okay, this is what the culture must demand of us, so we'll create all of these special kinds of questions uh, to, to make people from First Nations communities feel more inclusive, uh, then the CBC reports that that is offensive. It's like you can never do, you can never please the woke people at the CBC. No matter what you do, they're going to be outraged. They're going to write a negative story. Of course, um, all of this is predicated on the idea that it was an indigenous group that created the questions for the bank. So the bank went to a First Nations group, said, can you help us come up with some questions to remove the barriers in the application process so that we can attract more First Nations people? They do that. And then, and then it's and then it's offensive uh, to First Nations people who are actually applying for it. So again, there is no pleasing the woke mob. No matter what you do, you will always offend them in some way. This is this is one of my uh, favorite stories. Uh, it's just so amusing to watch the left spin itself in circles over this kind of thing. And again, the CBC report it like it's some kind of a scandal when they're the ones that are pushing for this kind of stuff. Harrison, what did you make of this story? Well, the, the thing about the banks is, and everyone knows this, that the banks are basically racing to racing each other to be the most woke. It's sort of like a race to the bottom. And they don't frankly care about what other people think as long as they satisfy the people that, you know, the, the, the corporate social responsibility standards that all these banks are trying to reach, which is just basically how woke can you get? How far are you willing to go and willing to push it? But it, it just sort of, you know, this is exactly the kind of thing that happens when people get so lost in this race to be the wokest. Um, that they just they just end up losing all kind of semblance of common sense. The there's a there's a screenshot of the question that this woman was asked in the CBC article, and it it's so it's crazy. I mean, the, the, part of the question, which it's a totally different application for indigenous applicants, which I find to be, um, which you would think would be almost problematic in it, in its own in its own way. Uh, but the, one of the questions was. A part of one of the questions says, feel free to write a song, poem, dress in traditional regalia, or bring in backup dancers. <laughs> exclamation point. <laughs> yes, exclamation point, you know, to, <laughs> to, to your application for the bank. Um, I, I just don't, I, I, it's, it's, it's just incredible to me what these people were thinking. And of course, this was written by, uh, by an indigenous group. Of course it was, right? Because it just plays into this narrative that, you know, the, the further you go into this woke rabbit hole, the more you lose your mind and you end up just sounding, you know, insane. I mean, what, what were these people thinking? Uh, did they not expect to get some sort of pushback on that? And I found this to be interesting because this seems to be, Candice, a new segment. The CBC has added this go public segment. I've never seen it before. And it basically looks like it's some sort of opportunity for citizens to air their grievances uh, and to have it kind of masked as, a, as an investigative journalism piece. But really, this is just an example of of how things that go woke end up turning out to be very bad uh, and they just make people look absolutely ridiculous. Well, it's a total misreading of it as well, right? Like they're kind of making it seem like, oh, the bank is disrespecting the sacredness of regalia. We're like, like as if it was like, you know, some like white corporate people that had written this question in a very condescending way. Of course, in reality, no, it wasn't. It was people from the community trying to actually do like genuine outreach. Um, It's just that, again, it comes across as incredibly condescending. So it's so it's so odd, Harrison, that the CBC is kind of almost like holding the bank accountable for 
were being condescending to First Nations people, even though it was the First Nations people groups uh, that came up with these initiatives in the first place. It's it's just uh, such such a such a sad state of affairs when it comes to the sort of official official woke uh, perspective in in today's culture that, that permeated throughout the media, throughout banks, uh, everywhere, and. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful that the CBC reported it because it's so silly. Uh, it gives us a, a, a little window into the absurdity of woke culture uh, happening over there. So uh, <laughs> lot, lot, lots of lots of fake news as usual. Harrison, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. It's, it's been a fun show. Absolutely. A pleasure to be on. All right. Thank you so much. That's Harrison Faulkner. I'm Candace Malcolm. It's fake news Friday on The Candace Malcolm Show.